Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the C Star League. That is the Collegian Star League, the best in college Dota. My name is Toffees, and I will be joined by the rest of the TriCast, or the TriHardCast, depending on how you feel about their analysis. And that will be Gorgon and Zingle. And I'll bring them in in just a second. Before I do, though, I want to let you guys know a couple of quick things. Important housekeeping, if you will. First, we are hiring a social media manager at cstarleague.com. The position has not yet been filled, so we're still taking applications. If you want to work in esports and know how to run things like the Twitters, go check it out right now. Second, Midwest Campus Clash. We're giving away $25,000 if teams can earn it on April 8th at Columbia College in Missouri. So if you're interested in checking out some college esports in your neck of the woods and live in the Midwest, get over there and check that out. Finally, I do want to tell you about one of our sponsors, Asus Gaming. We're super excited to have them on uh, as part of the CSL family this year. We're even more excited because if you go to cstarlink.com right now, you can enter to win one of three brand new gaming laptops, $500 cash, and lots and lots of swag. Basically, if you can create a video that goes on YouTube uh, or has a YouTube format and it talks or shows off college Dota in some way or uh, college esports in general, you have a chance to win. So head over there. Don't miss your chance to win free stuff. Definitely check it out. Also, of course, as always, big thank you to Twitch for making it all possible. Their support makes the CSL what it is. And finally, Band Gaming, the primary social app of the CSL. Lots of great features. Really, if you do anything that is team related, get yourself on ban gaming now real quick i'm going to turn it over to my boys gorgon and zingle and let them do the draft time breakdown hello hello i am single and i'm gorgon Ready. all right so with this draft underway we see georgia tech they had first pick here so it's uh relevant to know that they took the centaur right away and then texas instantly responded with that lifestealer abaddon dual pick without using any like of their pick time or reserve time there so how do you feel about these openings so far? Uh, Centaur is a very, very strong hero right now. Has been for some time. Hasn't really had the wind knocked out of his sails. Uh, Life Solar Abaddon, both very popular, pretty strong heroes, particularly in pubs. Um, I'm not seeing an immediate and obvious synergy between them that doesn't exist otherwise. Uh, so right. presumably something's going to fill in the gaps. Right. Normally with uh, Lifestealer, you see some of those initiating offlaners that have the Blink Dagger or just like long range initiation like Clock. Abaddon is not one of those, but it does kind of fit Reserve that time. just run at you lineup. And I think this one-two punch still is pretty strong because it leaves the openings for the other roles for that initiation role. And Lifestealer does well against Centaur, and Abaddon just Damn. does well in general. It's like one of the highest win rates right now in pubs. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan. Yeah. yeah. And then something... Well, I just do want to point out something that I point out an awful lot at the Sea Star League is that when we're talking a lot about these stats, we do a lot of talking about pub stats because these are non-pro teams. So talking about professional statistics like, oh, you know, Bad such and such is on the rise at DAC is not necessarily very telling about players that range Reserve between time. usually 4K and 6K, Turn but there's time. a variety in the team and most of their practice comes from Radiance pick. Right. At the same time, though, I also want to say that it is probably uh, relevant that they approach the pro level the further we get into the tournament because there are only the top teams left. Anywho, a uh, hero that is here in the draft that uh, we haven't talked about yet, Shadow Shaman, with that plus 18 damage bonus uh, buff from that last patch. Do you think it's, it has a place? I still haven't seen it picked in pro scene or pubs almost at all, even still. I, I think he's no Damn, stronger than he had been in fact i think that the range nerf the 100 range is a Five lot seconds. for a oh, yeah. harasser I, I think that that was actually maybe a little overboard even with the serious damage Reserve increase that he time. got uh, i've played him because uh, i i primary support i i think he plays fine right now but mm -hmm. he's still very hard to play around in terms of, of making sure your power strikes excuse me power spikes line up with your allies um i think with the juggernaut and the centaur Georgia have a good basis for a mid-game surge uh, alongside the Shadow Shaman for some push, but I don't think this is a hero we're going to see shoot out uh, of the gate either in pubs or in the pro scene this patch. Right. All right. So now to get back to the, the bands, I don't know if we've mentioned it very much, but a lot of the like super meta bands in that first phase, and then the second phase we're seeing some, I don't know, less, bands less ban worthy heroes i don't know the last time i've seen storm ban terrorblade ban isn't really uh 
as often. I don't know. Yeah, the it's, Storm uh, ban makes sense to me, to me because a lot of teams in CSL have signature Storm players. He's one of those pub stomp heroes that, that high school players tend to like to play a lot because he feels really energetic and fun and you really engage in the game. So high school players tend to play Storm uh, really, really well, right? At least a certain percentage of them. And then in addition to that, you have a Life Sealer on the other team. So you really, really don't want a good Storm Spirit player with a Life Sealer on his team. Right. That is the Infest uh, combo that we're talking about. Yeah, with that other character, and you know they still haven't really addressed that issue, and it looks like all that they have yeah, left yeah, is most likely that like roaming support. So we could see something like a spear breaker or something along that lines of just like that really mobile four position. Yeah, you could I guess have the Abaddon take a support role, like a four spot role, uh, as as he used to be played a lot, especially in pubs, and then have something like a clockwork off lane. Ten seconds uh, to go. I I tend to agree with you that you're probably going to be looking at a Five support seconds. here, maybe a support who's gonna go in for a blink dagger. I, I honestly I don't see great synergy here for Texas. I guess if it's a if it's a Quas Wex Invoker, Invoker and the Warlock have really good synergy. And if it's if you're doing a lot of skirmishes, Abaddon and Lifesteal are a good chase down and kill uh, heroes. But the four of them together don't really seem to want the same kinds of engagements. You know what I mean? Right. Also, something you mentioned really briefly about Abaddon going support and then Clockwork playing the three role. What mm -hmm. if they just do Clockwork as the four role? We have seen that yeah. somewhat. It gives them some nice like you know lockdown and catch. Yes, their landing stage might be weak because Warlock has no stun, Abaddon has no stun, Lifestealer has no stun, and then Clockwork is that you know melee run at you. Yeah, but uh, I, don't, I don't love the Clockwork. I mean, we could see it. Um, it's certainly something they might try to run. I don't mm -hmm. love it. You could also see maybe something like a Ricky or a Bounty Hunter in a four spot here. That's true. Um, you don't really need the jump if you're just kind of invis under them. Yeah, and, and Shadow Shaman and Rubik are both moderately greedy supports in terms of Rubik really wants a Blink Dagger or uh, no, really, really wants a Blink Dagger. If you're if you're a high skill Rubik player, then you want to be able to get around the fights very uh, right. handily. Shadow Shaman's kind of the same boat, especially with the the range to or the nerf to his range really would like to have some mobility. Um, and especially if he doesn't want to peek out at like 30 minutes, he's going to need to get some items up. That implies Ten that nobody go. on George is really prepared to just sink everything into dust in centuries. Right. Okay, well, the SF last pick, I do like that against the Invoker. It matches up fairly well. You're going to get your farm almost uncontested. Yeah. Um, and it does mean Juggernaut's not mid. He is a safe lane. So Juggernaut does fairly well against Abaddon, especially with these two supports that'll help lock him down. Yeah, so I might have to agree with you now that Abaddon might not go off lane, and it's uh, likely to see a four Abaddon and then something in the three roll that does fill both of those uh, gaps in the draft that we were talking about. Yeah, I'm I'm really Someone's interested to see what they pick up here, just because their draft is, is hey, I'm I'm having trouble visualizing the hero that connects the single target damage from Life Sealer and Abaddon to the team fight desires of Invoker and Warlock. I'm really not seeing the missing link. And, and granted, sometimes you just oh, don't see God. it until it's there. But what, what, what do you pick? I, I think, honestly, like a Timbersaw or a Clockwork are probably their best options. Uh, but I don't think either of those is a particularly good option unless they get off to a really good start. Honestly, they might go something a little bit greedy because as it is right now, Invoker against Shadow Fiend, like I was saying, is kind of a wash matchup. Neither of them really has the best kill potential on the other unless it's like an, a dra uh, an outplay or like a gank that happens. But like if, you know, all things held even, those heroes match up fairly well. So I think Texas is okay leaving the Lifestealer against the Centaur, get his farm, leave the Invoker against Shadow Fiend, get the farm, and then just kind of go these greedy cores. Because once they hit that like 20 minute lineup, if they go, you know, a Warlock with a Midas, Invoker with a Midas, Lifestealer with his stuff, they do hit that really strong spike at around 20 minutes, 20 something. Yeah, um, the, unfortunately, the like twenty something minutes against a Juggernaut, a Shadow Shaman, and a Shadow Fiend, all of whom do really good early game damage if left mm -hmm. alone. It, twenty minutes, you could be looking at no tier ones left, and suddenly you're having to use your power spike to reverse momentum rather than Five gain seconds. momentum. And that's true. It, it, that it, that is something that can work. You know, I almost said Sand King earlier, but then I thought, like, uh, I don't know. Uh, I I like it. It fills I, that stun roll, and it could be a three or a four. I think it's a three-spot Sand King, and that's kind of why 
I pulled off of it earlier um, rather than jumping on onto the, the Sand King Mad Wagon. I do think that this is a pretty decent pickup. I guess alternatively, they could try to run him jungle, like in a four-spot jungle roaming position. That might gonna, actually be what they do. I, I think it might be a dual offlane, actually. An Abaddon Sand King lane mm-hmm. is very strong, and they're against yeah. a melee juggernaut. So if you're trying to kill a yeah, Sand right. King and he has an Abaddon shield behind him and he's just hitting the creeps with Caustic, what can you do to it? Yeah, it's hard to kill him, and he wins a melee matchup almost always. Damn yeah, and he does have cool. burrow strike to get in and kill a healing ward. Although then he doesn't have anything to get out, so you do Five have to be seconds. very dependent on the on the uh, uh, phonic shield. Right. So I'm interested to see how they actually match that up, but uh, I don't know. Do you think either team comes out way ahead in the draft? I, I think it's pretty even. Way ahead. Yeah, I think it's pretty yeah. even too, but. Uh, I do think that a lot of this is in Texas's execution. Uh, if Texas kind of failed to execute, uh, they're, they're going to have a lot of trouble around that 20 minute mark that we were talking about or by that 20 minute mark. Um, Very nice, gentlemen. I think there's a little more room for error from Georgia Tech. Well, you've heard the brains, now hear the beauty. As I join the gentlemen for what's going to be a very important game, this is the Sea Star League match between Georgia Tech and University of Texas. Boys, the winner of this moves on to the Elite Eight, which means they are one best of three away from traveling to the land final and playing for their share of $50,000. That means it's all on the line, and we get to watch them do it. Speaking of all on the line, the guys from the dire Georgia Tech get together with a early smoke rotation on the bottom. Uh, Zingle, why don't you go ahead and introduce us to Georgia Tech as we get this thing underway. All right. On Georgia Tech, we have Bartleby playing the support Rubik. Add Stant on the Shadow Shaman. That shit is Fuego on the carry jug. Game is hard. The one MMR solo player, according to his profile, on Shadow Fiend. And Leaden Toke on the Centaur War Runner. I do want to port Leaden, or point out Leaden Toke wearing the very nice red headdress from being at TI or paying a fortune to say that he was. Uh, Gordon, why don't you introduce us to University of Texas, Austin? Well, for University of Texas, Austin, we do have La Flame crawling around on the Life Stealer. 50 Shades is mixing up with the Invoker. Maximo is the Sand King. X Love O on the Abaddon and Cross Angel calling out the demons on the Warlock. All right, so those are the lineups as the game gets underway. Uh, not a lot came out of the smoke except for a nice ward to get a little bit of early control here in terms of the lane. The last hit deny charts are up for you guys to keep an eye on as we get into this very important matchup for the evening. Actually, let's jump down to where a little bit of fighting time is going on. Maximo's going to get caught by the ever-powerful shackle from the high ground. Bartleby on the chase has saved himself telekinesis. The spin to win will hold him inside. He's got nowhere to go but try to get out the back. And it's not going to happen. First Blood denied uh, the creep. He tried to get that creep to kill him, but it did not happen. So they were able to he get did. that last hit. He did actually have a burrow strike. He could have gotten away there, but he wanted to deny to the creep. I, I mm-hmm. think he thought that that was a safer call. Right. Um, turns out to have not been the safer call. Absolutely. Yeah. So great First Blood for them to get this thing started out right out of the gate here. Uh, you talked about the way that you guys expected this to line up. Did it fall in exactly the way that you thought you would see these lanes go? Yeah, this uh, dual offlane is what I expected. Uh, I didn't really expect them to die right away like this. Because speaking of not one. expecting death, let's look at the Sand King who just tried to make a move, gets caught in the ever-powerful shackle again, but they're not going to have Telekinesis up. He does have Burrow Strike, but this is a pretty big blow to Maximo. I mean, he just can't get in there to harass. How hard is it to be two melees dealing with this lineup? Well, they don't have Caustic Finale yet, and that's really when this lane starts to get nasty. I, I, I'm a little surprised that Maximo's being so aggressive. He doesn't have the... He, he just doesn't have the ability to do that yet. I think that this lane is going to start to turn into their favor, potentially, once you get about two levels of Caustic Finale up. And at that point in time, the Rubik is going to want to be rotating anyway, so either you're chaining your supports to that top lane or you're letting the Juggernaut fall behind. That's the theory, anyway. Right. Okay. If you're keeping both supports top, this matchup, Invoker is way ahead in this mid lane. 9 and 6, opposed to 5 and 0. And against a Shadow Fiend who really needs these early CS, that's a pretty big lead. Now, so, this is yeah, a. He's died once, but. I'll say, this is a close matchup. I don't know if you guys had a chance to talk about records between the two teams, but they are very close. Laflam actually making a move on Leaden Talk, who is going to be able to get himself out, but taking a lot of damage here. These teams are only separated by about two games across both ends of the season. So, uh, this should be a pretty solid matchup in determining who goes forward. 
But I'm going to tell you, whoever they advance to go up against is going to be one of the teams that finished in the top probably two seeds. So they really need to be on their game after this going forward in this tournament. They're going to be aggressive again up top. I and mean, honestly, I, at this point in time, the Juggernaut's just missing so much CS trying to get these impossible kills. That I'm not even, I'm not even positive that this aggression is worth it for them. It's it's almost certainly not. As you saw there, like they realize they can't just go on the Sand King again because Abaddon mm -hmm. will save them. But yeah. then they try to go on both heroes, and then they just don't have the lockdown or damage to finish it off. They can't lift the Abaddon and shackle the other and expect to have enough output to, and you know, kill one. Now we're starting to see the moment where the supports are going to be forced to rotate away. There's no more mana regen uh, consumables on the Shadow Shaman or the Rubik. Rubik's buying out his last clarity now. So at this point in time, they're going to have to rotate, probably use a shrine, try to help the mid out, or mm -hmm. they're going to have to be very, very choosy <laughs> about when they decide to engage. Mm -hmm. And that means that you're going to start seeing more aggressive potential come out of Sand King and the Abaddon with a lot less punishment onto that. Right. The second that the supports leave, Juggernaut has to play extremely carefully, otherwise you could just die in the blink of an eye. So let's talk timers. Uh, we often, when we watch Dota, we realize that there is uh, a certain time frame that some teams' drafts have to hit in order to be successful, right? You want to get your Meepo finished up by 30 minutes and, and sort of pushing towers, etc. Are either of these teams on a really specific time frame, or do they both have a pretty comfortable push into the extreme late game? I it's really think... hard for me to say, and I'm, I'm going to take the, the lead here and then let Zingle be smarter than I am. It, it's hard for me to say because of all the very recent changes to lane experience, uh, right? We're, we're looking at all of our traditional wisdom about timing windows is kind of under question because hmm. we're used to the game pace being completely different. So everything's about 10% slower, which means the supports for Dai are going to get up to their level 6, so a more than 10% slower. And that level six on Shadow Shaman is really important for that team. I would say probably by 13 minutes, I would want to see Dire Side pushing towers. And by 20 minutes, I would want to see UT engaging uh, as a team. But it's, it's really hard to say for sure. Okay, now Sand King, I'm gonna stop before we get to Zingle's analysis and to look at Zand King have to juke around the outside here. Now he is probably gonna get away and we gotta point out that shit is Fuego yeah, is, okay, so they'll, they'll kill him. But Fuego's off lane for a very long time to get this kill. Yeah. At the same time, though, they actually got a kill on the Invoker That's mid true. with the uh, Centaur rotating in. Yeah. Very nice. I, All right, I really so like that Centaur rotation because the supports just can't leave this top lane, right? They just yep. don't have the potential to strip off. So Centaur yeah, 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 sacrifices yeah, yeah, yeah. his lane uh, in order to make sure the mid is doing well, which I think is much more important than the Centaur doing well this stage. Yep. So, Zingo, let me ask you, what's your thoughts on timing? Do you agree with what Gorgon said? Do you kind of have your own perception of how this game has to be played out? As someone who's played in Collegiate Dota before, how do you think this fits? I think these drafts are very even matched up at the late stages of the game. Juggernaut and Shadowfiend and and uh, Centaur, both or all three skill very well into the late game. But at the same time, Invoker is borderline OP when it gets late because you just have a ridiculous amount of spells and abilities and, you know, everything that you can do. Abaddon scales very well if you get those items, if you build it into that core, and then obviously Lifestealer uh, is one of the classic late game carries. So I do think they match up evenly. He may scale well in the late game, but right now it's not going so well as he gets picked off again. So once that Centaur rotation, then again to a rotation by everybody else essentially, uh, and isn't, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that Invoker is one of those heroes that is even more level dependent than most in the sense of needing to get up and running, and two kills this early is going to be a huge detriment to their their push as a team. Yeah, so yep. he's still the same level as the Shadow Fiend, you do have to keep in mind. Because, because of the reduction to experience out there, being dead for a little longer actually hurts a lot less. Mm. Um, so he'll probably end up being about half a level behind the Shadow Fiend, which is not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things, but it is going to slow down how quickly he can engage. Um, and as we said, we, we really want to see by, what did I say, about 20 minutes seems right. We want to see big team fights coming out of UT. And Invoker, if he starts to fall behind now, could very easily flag behind that, uh, that, that window. Absolutely. And as we speak about big deals, we do want to mention up on top during our analysis, there was a kill on Abaddon, but on the bottom there was an exchange kill, uh, very valuable on the Centaur. So both offlaners go down, and uh, really this is a very even game. Georgia Tech with a thousand gold lead, but it's not as big as I think it looks. It seems like both of these teams are 
executing, maybe I, I guess Radiant's not quite getting what they wanted out of the first two minutes, but since then, it seems like a relatively even game. Yeah, no, Dyer's had a really rough start with these lanes, but, you know, now if you look at it, SF is a little bit ahead of the Invoker on uh, Last Hit Deny, and he has the kills on mid. Bottom lane, I guess Centaur went and ganked mid a few times, so he's getting his levels. He's level 5. That's perfectly fine, considering you don't match up that well against Lifestealer. Right. And then the top lane did manage to get, you know, some of those return kills, those freebies given away. Yeah, I, I do think that the state of the game is, is fairly even, but I will say that Dyer are in a better spot looking ahead the next two or three minutes. Shadow Shaman's going to hit six well before Warlock, who's still level three. Um, and the Rubik's going to hit level six before the Sand King. All right, so that, that means that we're going to be looking at that Serpent Ward pushes before UT are really able to manage them. And that's a, that's a big threat. Mm -hmm. Sand King goes down in the middle to a nice play from the Shadow Fiend. It looked like unassisted. And immediately we go up to the top where Bartleby, Fuego, and Adstin are going to go ahead and start to lean on this tower just a little bit here. Now, when you're playing in a lane, let's talk tri-lane here. Is there a goal to try and take that tower down relatively quickly to buy comfortable farm for the Juggernaut? Or do you want to keep that up to sort of manage equilibrium in your favor and, you know, keep control of where your opponents are? If you can take that tower early, it is always good. However, they keep sending heroes here to contest it on the side of uh, UT Austin. And now that Abaddon is level 6, I don't really foresee this tower going down anytime soon. Yeah. Um, ideally, though, yeah, if you could get the tower down, have the stack and pulling, because you're going to want to stack and pull a lot in a tri lane. You're going to need those levels to kind of keep you uh, relevant. Yeah, but, I, think, uh, I think this tri lane falls apart as soon as that Shadow Shaman gets 6, right? So yes. Yeah. That, and that's basically what they're waiting for. You would expect maybe they're waiting for something on the Juggernaut, but with this specific draft, it's really all about the Shadow Shaman. He is the linchpin to the pacing. All right, so we have an Invis Shadow Shaman who's creeping forward, trying to do what he does best. Was looking for a potential cure, but Maximo and 50 Shades keeping themselves at range, not getting caught out. Up on top, though, Adson taking a lot of damage. That, uh, that Warlock combo is okay. just really brutal at this stage of the game. So they're going to chase him backwards down the middle. They got a nice kill there on the Invoker. I don't. Invoker's dying an awful lot for my taste, Gorgon. Yeah. Yeah. That. I mean, that kill wasn't necessarily his fault. That Shadow mm -hmm. King was very patient with it in this room and just waited. Uh, this will be the Shaman up on top. Yeah. That. That's a really good kill. They, okay. That was another example of a patient kill, though. So both of these teams really sort of playing, I think, to the best of their ability and using smart positioning and not forcing the issue until they know that they can they can finish off their opponent yeah uh, so taking a look shadow shaman is halfway to level six between level five and level six that is mm -hmm. sand king still level three warlock is almost level five the experience advantage is becoming very telling at this stage mm. right, yeah so Looks like up on top, we still got the three playing their defensive game as they continue to get that farm in the pockets of the Juggernaut. He is at 3.8k. The only person higher than him is his teammate in the Shadow Fiend, but it is now three looking at three on this side of the map, and it smells like we're going to get some action here pretty soon. Omni Slash available on the Juggernaut as well as uh, Shadow Shaman very close to the Mass Serpent Ward. So once that he hits level six, is it just clear the creep wave, head straight towards the tower? Or do they want to use that to like expedite a fight? I think they want it on the tower. You know, in a perfect world, they can fight near their opponent's mm. tower, use, this, use certain wards to get a kill, and then also knock the tower down. Um, and something that you need to keep in mind about the Serpent Wards, because we have not seen a lot of Shadow Shaman for a while, mm -hmm. is that, remember, that the tower armor is now linked to the number of opponents that are nearby. So those Serpent oh. Wards, if you drop the Serpent Wards and just have the Juggernaut stand and hit the tower, mm -hmm. those Serpent Wards do a ton more damage um, than they've ever done before. Uh, they stopped it. Might be dying up here. Abaddon does have the ultimate, so he will walk away with that, but he gets picked up, thrown back by the Rubik, lock, stock, dropped, and spun to death. No saving the Abaddon as he goes down. Double damage is bottled by the Shadow Fiend in the interim, which is worth noting. And down the bottom, La Flame actually having a very comfortable farm. He's he's almost completely caught up to both of the cores who are ahead of him. Zingle, did he manually activate that ultimate to try? Yep. And, and that was why? a big mistake. That got yeah. him killed. Uh, presumably he did that in order to try and dispel a stun. Yep. But, mm. but you can't 
do that because if you can, yeah, like you have multiple stuns at available, right? And so, at that point, you know, the TP was already canceled. Not being stunned right. isn't going to save you. Exactly. So at that point, you just want to run and then save your ultimate for, you know, that Omni Slash that's going to do the actual yeah. damage. Right, yeah. It'll, it'll automatically save you at the right time and then you get the maximum amount of health recovery out of it. Yeah, that was, uh, that was silly. And they're going to get the free Super War Tower there as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. You can see how quickly those chew through so, that tower. So you said in a perfect world they'd take the fight under the tower with the Serpent Wars, but I guess in a really perfect world they would just get the gank and then use the Serpent Wars for the tower. Yeah. Yeah. And, and immediately smoke rotate down to the bottom. They're going to use that shrine rotation to get in here, block off the creeps, potentially get a gank. Fortunately for the Radiant right now, nobody is down here to get found. Radiant's getting something mid. Yep. Nice. The second that the life uh, life stealer got the armlet, he TP top, he infested Maximo, and they smoked up and went towards mid. That was a very classic timing for the uh, life stealer. Once you get the armlet, Ooh. you just go fight. Omni Slash gonna come in, starts to spin. Aston taking a lot of damage, but the chase is on. Sand King drops down. The Flam wants to do a little bit of work, but Aston now he's gonna be the man left behind. Cross Angel heads to the high ground, turns back around. Fuego's got to be on the run. He doesn't have a spin to try and get out of this, but Laflam comes in, has the chase, doesn't have quite enough damage to burn him down. They can't go under tower. They can't afford to do it. The Brazers nice but is it nice enough cross angel in trouble let toke wanted to get closer but couldn't risk it and all of radiant walks away very low a very nice toggle by the way from the flum to make sure that he stays alive at the end of that fight uh nice like you said rotation by flame but a nice counter rotation immediately by the dire and it feels like for every inch that the radiant tries to take dire comes back and takes five radiant had no business walking into their jungle like that like you you don't have vision of four of your opponents you have no wards up in your own jungle and you know juggernaut has omni slash which means the only time you ever want to see him is in lightning creeps right mm -hmm. walking out here that omni slash is just a guaranteed kill if, if he happens he, even if there's like a seven percent chance that he's there that's a seven percent chance for an automatic kill speaking of a guaranteed kill potentially 50 shades get picked up and thrown down goes in viz gets away with a hundred health bartleby is going to chase forward he needs to get back because he's being attacked Nice double stun coming by the Sand King. Shadow Feed just barely backs off with enough health. Can he survive? Laflam gets juked in the trees. Now he's isolated from the rest of his friends. Fuego wants to chase. Doesn't have an Omni Slash. They're going to slow him down. Ultimates pop by Shadow Fiend. Sunstrike to finish the job. Down he goes. Flame trying to get away. Bracer toggle like a boss. Gets to the low ground. Moves through the stairs. Toggling, toggling. He will get away. Or will he? Let Toke tries with the blink. Says he reveals it. But it's just not enough. Laflame is too fast. Pops the phase boots. Abaddon is here to help. And he gets away with some sick toggling. But it's not over, baby. This Maximo came in to help from behind. Gets up a single stun. But now he's alone. Has to go in Viz to get himself out of trouble. And the rest of the team's got to run. Fuego knows he's got to go. Flame is back in. Already at half health. Healed himself up nicely. With some help from the Warlock, they'll push down to the high ground. And finally, this fight will break down. What a fight. That was a great play by Lifestealer. They didn't panic when he was infested on the Sand King and just go for the Rubik, who was in the river. But they went way for that backline Shadow Fiend. Yeah, and that was very smart. They they did miss the kill for the first part of it, but the mm -hmm. good sunstrike at the end, like that's just overall a good execution from UTA for considering how sloppy it started out, and considering it started it's out a very by good recovery. It's a very yeah. technical recovery, yeah. yeah. And I will point out, like any fight like that at this stage in the game is is a really a big win for UTA because they forced out Shadow Shaman's ultimate mm -hmm. where Shadow Shaman wasn't pushing. Mm -hmm. So now the push is being slowed down by an additional 120 seconds. That's two extra minutes that you just bought before the mid game breaks down. And uh, that's two minutes that, that UT can use to their advantage. Double damage was on the centaur. He was looking for something to get out of it. He's got the rest of the crew in behind him. They're gonna go ahead and get the D ward. Pretty much sends the signal that they're headed towards the bottom lane to take out this tier one to get them a little more jungle access as they seem to enjoy playing that very aggressive style of game so far. It's worked in their favor. However, the Goldie, which was once 3,000, is now at less than, I think, 200. The XP is in UT's favor for the first time. So Georgia Tech does sort of need to step back and say, okay, what do we do to regain control of this game? They gotta push, and that's what they're doing now. They're gonna push this, and then they're immediately going to rotate mid, maybe under cover smoke, and try to use Serpent Wards to either take a fight or take the tower mid. Um, that's the right call. I also like how these guys are pushing. Uh, they're they're pushing with just two heroes on the tower. They're hiding the rest of their heroes, both to prevent the armor accumulation on the tower, but also just to make it more difficult for Texas to justify Ooh. engaging. 
Let him tow. He's going to get himself out just in time. This is a nice little blink engage because he was... I think he was about to get hit there, so he sort of preempted their attack by launching his own and had to use his ultimate to get out though which means that they will not have that escape potential which may be why sand king's bomb was juking around fast with that haste looking to get something right, when so centaur's we'll ulti is down do you have to make a move what, centaur warlock down mm -hmm. sorry yeah. go ahead. i was just gonna say they don't have to make a move but they really should if they can force mm -hmm. out the shadow shaman wards here even if they get nothing else and don't lose anything that by itself is is a huge victory just right. try to force out those wards. Makes sense. Like you're saying. Go ahead. Centaur ult is down. They finally got Warlock ult back up. They don't really know that Juggernaut was at no health, no mana, and running to base, but the fact that it is just, you know, kind of <laughs> helps them out with this push here. They're going to start to lean in. The tower going to get hit pretty hard. Bart will be able to steal himself an aphotic shield, which is pretty nice. There's the shot from the back. Out comes Life Stealer. Pops and locks. They do get the ultimate from the Shadow Shaman that they wanted, but he dies. There's the spin from Fuego. They got to watch out because that invoker is getting very low. The chase is on. They're going to try to finish him. So Fuego's going to chase him down. Meanwhile, we're going to lose the Shadow Fiend behind the tower. Bartleby and Leaden Toke trying to get themselves out of trouble. Laflamme with the toggles, baby. Gets it in fest off. Leaden's got to back away. Fuego's still alive. It's three for the price of one. And they got the ultimate from the Shadow Shaman. Make it four as Toke goes down. Fuego's trying to finish Flame, but this guy toggles like he was made of magic, man. Yeah, that, that was like six different toggles in the fight that he could have died from if he uh, mistimed it. Also, I want to point out, that would have been very different had uh, Invoker not been able to take, I think it was Fuego as well as the Shadow Fiend, down to about here on Chase. So the guys from Radiant were able to take out the other two, you know, tear the supports apart, and then be ready when Fuego came back. Yeah, we're starting to approach that 20-minute mark where we had said Radiant really wants to be team fighting. It, it's very, very good that they're actively able to and comfortable team fighting short of that marker. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that is that they got going a little bit faster than I estimated. Part of that is honestly that the fights have kind of broken out in a unexpectedly favorable position. For example, the Juggernaut just not being around for the start of that fight really hurt uh, Georgia. Mm -hmm. All right, so the gold lead is now 3,000 in UT's favor, a little under 4,000 in terms of experience. The top two farmers, both on the side of UT, a big swing from where it was not even three minutes ago. So this game still going back and forth, a regular EKG on the gold chart. Excited to see where we go. As like I said, both of these teams fighting A for their life in this tournament and B, a slot in the Elite Eight. I mean, they've, if I remember correctly, they've already made the money. But getting to this round got them $500, okay? The next round increases that exponentially and puts you at a shot to make almost $20,000 if you're the top team in this tournament. So that's, I mean, okay. Zingo, you're a college student. Uh, Gorgon, you're a writer, so I guarantee that you probably don't have a lot of money either. <laughs> <laughs> if someone tells you you can win $20,000 for playing Dota, does that impact your game? It does. It's nerve-wracking. I had played last year, and I remember the hardest game. It wasn't the one in the finals after you already made it to the LAN. It was the one right before that round of eight game was the most stressful thing in the world. Mm. Because, you know, the amount of money you make, the, the trip itself to the LAN, all of that is just hanging mm. over your shoulders the entire game. And you know these teams have to be feeling it. Every game just gets harder and harder here. You know, every year I feel like the competition gets harder, so. That's true. We, we see, I think... In terms of the average player this year, we're seeing a lot more independent skill from player to player mm -hmm. than, than we did last year. And last year was honestly pretty good. Very nice. Now, I, I will ask you, Zingle, you brought this up because of last year when you played. Uh, so last year, the LAN final was at PAX South in Austin, Texas. Pretty cool event. This year, we're getting an entire theater up in, uh, I think, it, is it Vancouver? Just, just want to just wanna correct is DreamHack. Don't, don't. I'm sorry, DreamHack, not yeah. PAX. DreamHack South in Austin. Uh, we're going to Canada this year for a, basically buying out a big theater, tons of esports for college event there. What is that yeah. like as a college East, East, athlete? What do we want to call? I don't know what you want to call yourself, but I mean, how is that? Is that almost cooler than the prize money in some ways? Yeah, for for sure. The the trip to Toronto this year that would be absolutely awesome for any player. Just the fact that you can tell your friends, you can tell your family, like, hey, I played games in college, and not only did I play games, but I played so well that they actually flew me out to Toronto to play live 
with all their uh, most, For most of the teams in the league, they would be able to officially say, I have been flown internationally. <laughs> That's true. I, You know, you can guarantee that like, even the football teams at the university probably can't say that. The international athletes, yeah, no, yeah. It's, uh, it's a unique thing, and it's definitely part of the draw. It's definitely part of also the stress. <laughs> Speaking of the stress, uh, you can really see the advantage and the momentum coming out of the Radiant side team here, that they're able to mm -hmm. just collapse onto a tier two, and there is absolutely no defense, despite the fact Centaur Ultimate is up, Shadow Shaman Ultimate is up, Juggernaut Ultimate is up, and Juggernaut is really, really close to his Manta. Ooh, Bartleby's got a rod and used to scan very effectively to keep himself alive. They're going to think about making a move here on Maximo. Jumps forward. This is a, They need this engagement right now. The problem is they have the kill advantage. So if you were just joining the game and looking at, you know, the kill count and sort of items and things of that issue, you might say, well, you know, GA, G, uh, or Georgia Tech is doing pretty well. Is that true or is it much more skewed towards Radiant than we maybe can tell by just looking at it? I think if you just look at this game on track Dota or whatever, mm. I think it's pretty clear that Texas is in control. They have a tier mm. two, whereas there's no tier twos down on their side of the map. Their life stealer is sitting on top of two core items, whereas the Juggernaut sitting on top of none. Mm. And that, th that that's basically the two metrics by which I would look at this game. Also, the fact that the Invoker with a Midas is able just to free farm this whole time. She's not even like participating in the mm -hmm. fights. You're just going around and farming where you need to farm. And now... 3,000 ahead of the next player on the other team. Yeah. And it's just going to keep growing because it's the Midas and just the fact that you can Sunstrike from afar. Your team is pushing towers for you. This is just like the dream situation for UT Austin. Yeah, so yeah. I would say this game is one fight close. It is one yep. fight away from breaking back in Georgia's favor, but right now it is just empirically not in their control. They've yep. got to hit that control. And also, I do want to point out that whether or not it was on purpose, Radiant's shrine timings have been absolutely on point. They literally get a tower, take a fight, find a shrine, and then move on to the next one. And it seems like it's always off cooldown right about the time they need it to be. So uh, very nice usage of that regen. They're coming right here to mid to defend, and they are already at full health thinking about fighting. Fuego's going to come forward. They pop the glyph because why not? Slow him down just a little bit, but Flane is going to back away here as the illusions help out with the scouting. They don't want to get caught with vision. They know Centaur has his ultimate up. Uh, they know they can find themselves in a bit of trouble if somebody's out of position, so they'll use those mantas. And uh, once they, I think that once they see the manta illusions, they say, well, maybe this isn't the fight for us. And so I'll let Jordan them take the tower. Juggernaut does have Manta up now, and that's that's a pretty big item mm -hmm. in this game. Manta is difficult for the Warlock to deal with because the illusions soak up the Fatal Bonds damage. Um, but like you, you hit them with Fatal Bonds and they die instantly, so they don't actually get very much damage across right. through the rest of the units. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to deal with that if you're the Life Stealer as well, because uh, he's all single target damage. Um, you do have potentially some disjoint. In okay. they go, they're gonna make the big jump. Huge AoE initiation from Max. They see the explosion of the Life Stealer, and nobody goes down right away though. Ward's on the inside. We're gonna see Warlock use his ultimate, slows everyone down. Centaur falls, Rubik falls. Sand King finally goes down up on top. They'll heal at the shrine, and both will go their respective ways. So a huge initiation. The Warlock into the Sand King bomb was inevitable. The guys had to go for the Aegis though, right? Like, did they have another option? They... it was a little forced, however, mm -hmm. they did use scan to see that, you know, nobody was coming. Their scan was a little bit early, however. They mm -hmm. used it at the starter rush rather than, like, midway or at the end, so it ran out before the gank came. And also, that was the blink reveal on Sand King, I believe. So they didn't right. know that that uh, was going to happen as suddenly as it did. Yeah. I and mean, suddenly I'm, it did. Um, I'm omniscient in this game, and that blink actually surprised me. I hadn't noticed it. It came out. <laughs> so. It was brutal, and now La Flam, Flam, Flem, however you want to say it, Flame. has an Aegis <laughs> as he heads towards the bottom lane. And that, if nothing else, has to cause some mental anguish on the sides of Georgia. You are already struggling to deal with this team, not able to kill La Flame at all in the last couple of fights because of his ability to sort of juke like a boss, and now he's got a, an Aegis. But they will not be deterred as Fuego leaves a smoke rotation. Comes down to the bottom. They want to get the Omni. There's a nice jump with the stun. Holds the Omni Slash for a second. Turns back around. Sand King's in trouble. Flame's going to be locked up. They want to try to get that Aegis out very quickly. They do. Abaddon gets his ultimate pop. This is the right time to get it. And now they want to make their chase. They're going to go forward. Let Toke gets a stun up on Abaddon. He'll get in trouble. He ends up going down. Now it's on the Flame. He still has the Aegis. He was able to infest the Abaddon. And they don't have the speed to chase him. Cross Angel hiding in the trees. Goes invisible and TPs to safety.
That was Ledin, such a good play by Ledin Ledin comes in. He, he probably just saved that life sewer yeah. and the Aegis. And, and that that's such a such a small play, right, from Cross Angel. All he did was throw down that slow, mm -hmm. invis himself, TP out, but you know, it's little plays like that from supports we don't often talk about that, that literally yeah. change games. Well, and War so Warlock, especially with the slow, seems to me like one of the biggest unsung heroes in Dota. The, it, nobody really ever talks about that spell and how powerful it is, but at the right time, in the right place, it's a game changer. Absolutely. If you don't have Centaur ult to, like, counter it, mm -hmm. your heroes are just stuck. And an SF standing still or immobile in the center of a fight is not what you want. I guess he does have the BKB, the 10 second BKB now. Uh, but still. Well, I mean, he's got, that means BKB. As well, don't misunderstand how that works. They think right. that that spell slows you for how long you've been in it, nope. but it slows you for how long it's been channeled. Mm. So once you start that channel, any hero that walks into it is slowed for the maximum of the channel time. Which oh. is a I'm gonna big I'm gonna deal. stop you real quick as Fuego finds himself in a tough situation. Is gonna spin to safety and go on the run, but everyone from Radiance here, Fuego thought about coming back in. He actually is gonna get hit pretty hard by the cold snaps. Will they finish the job? Fuego in some trouble. Goes to the Omni Slash to buy a little bit more time, but look at the slow meatball to finish the job. And on top of old Smokey. They nail him. So there, oh, this is bad. Shadow Shaman gets caught out. A huge double stun again from the Sand King. That is a triple. The ultimate from Maximo used maybe a bit unnecessarily, but not even a big deal as they can now push in, take a tier two. On the bottom, Shadow Fiend's looking for a trade, but he can't safely do it. So he's going to have to back away and probably yield this tier two in the process. Can they go three on this? They can. And I think they will at least try to force a buyback here. I'm not sure they'll commit. Actually, they do have Aegis still for how long? Like a minute. Mm -hmm. So they will probably go high ground here. They will go high ground here. They're going to try to force out the buyback and the Serpent Wards before they're willing to back right. up. Like, I think they, they, they have to use Aegis here anyway. Right. Yeah, they might just commit fully because of the Aegis. They're fine with playing Life Stealer and baiting him like this. He will probably die in the next few seconds. But they're nice. fine with it. Nice play. The Flame's going to come forward. You see the ultimate from Abaddon popped. Centaur has to make a play. He ends up going down. Fuego with the spin. Dropping hard. Here comes the Warlock. He's going to throw his ultimate in. Bartleby too close to fire. He's going to get burned. The Flame playing like crazy. Aegis is still there. Toggling double stood from the Sand King. Aegis comes back up. Buyback from the Rubik. Flame chases Bartleby. Bartleby again just too close to Flame. Flame burns him down. Turns back around and wants Fuego. But it's not Fuego who's on. It seems like it's Flame. The heck is out, but he's going to walk away. 50 Shades is the survivor. Maximo going to head them back towards base and buy as much time as he can for his team to finish off the racks. He'll very likely get caught out and go down, but that's a sacrifice they'll make no, because now they can push onto the tower. He's that's fine. a huge win. Oh they, my they gosh. Got racks. They got two oh, buybacks and a doing? dieback. Okay. Nope. He might still be fine. Yeah, he's fine. Yeah, he get, he gets space. away. He kept him for so long. Makes the space. 50 Shades decides to do some blink spacing. Tornado comes out. They want to finish the last racks. They do. That'll be the range as well. Plus, they get a kill on the Rubik. They're going to get even more as Fuego gets burned down. Ledin Toke wants Maximos. He cannot do it. Maximos survives. But the Centaur War Runner does not. And just like that, the game comes crashing down around their heads like the temple around Samson. They've got nowhere to go. Sand King dies but at what cost it's a tut 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 team white baby as the guys from ut show us they came to play not only is that a team wipe i believe that's seven or eight kills they had because the buybacks were used because the respawn was uh used i think multiple times that's rough and now you know life stealer dies to a creep from a bad toggle the you know pretty funny after all those early toggles earlier but he just buys back pots and knowing that the buybacks are already down yeah, go ahead, I, I don't know, fist. how do you feel, Zingle, about, or, or I call out this, this last defense by Rubik? I, I'm, I'm, I have very mixed emotions about the Manta first from the Juggernaut, because it's such an expensive item. By the time he got it, this Lifestealer was balling. Like, this Lifestealer mm -hmm. was ready to fight um, by the time that Manta was even out. The thing Cross is, the Manta it. is a very good item on Juggernaut, especially this game to, you know, get rid of the open wounds and still be able to do damage, get rid of that Link. I'm pretty sure you can purge Link off. <laughs> so, you can purge it off so that damage that hits you doesn't hit your allies, but you cannot stop damage from hitting that hits your allies from hitting you. Gotcha. It's a one-way purge. That's interesting. Okay. I didn't actually know that. You guys, but, I just uh, want to... Yeah, the Manta. 
Go ahead. I, I just want to point out the fact that the gold, in case anybody was curious about just how big that fight was in terms of numbers, uh, went from about a 4,000 lead to a 20,000 lead in the course of exactly 1.3 set three minutes. So the guys from Dyer now desperation push, but they desperation push into a three-man EMP meatball nightmare that will cost them the centaur. He gets his ultimate up in desperation. Bartleby, where are you going? Bartleby stopped to GG, meatball, basically. Bro. He said, yeah. that tornado made me feel like Dorothy, and it is just not worth going forward. That'll be the end of the first game, but that's not the end of our match. This is the C Star League, the CSL, the best in college Dota. This is game one of a best of three between University of Texas and Georgia Tech, and it is bound to be a good one. The big bird is going to be on GT in the next round. My name's Toffees. You can find me at Toffees TV. Uh, Gorgon, where can they find you? Over at the Wonder Cow on the Twitter thingy. And Zingle? Uh, at Zingle Dota. And you can find all of us at the C at C Star League over there, as well as the dot com. Great spending the first game with you. Go nowhere. We'll be back in just a minute with game two of Georgia Tech versus University of Texas.